Well, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to your first presentation for IBEC uh, 2022. And we are welcoming the team from West Point today. My name is Jim Arnold, and I was a professor at University of St. Thomas in the MBA program. And I've been involved with IBEC for about 15 years now. Back before that, I was uh, actually a participant, or I should say a coach for several teams from St. Thomas, bringing them here. So I know firsthand what it takes for you to put on a presentation like this, for you to do the analysis, for you to work together on things. We really appreciate the amount of work that you put into it, and we definitely look forward to, to learning from you today. Why don't we start by uh, having, having the two of you, our two, uh, two people that are here, if you would introduce yourselves and just tell us, tell us a little bit about you. Jacob. Thank you, sir. So my name is Jacob Foster. I'm a junior here at the United States Military Academy. Um, I've been doing ethics debate for three years now. Um, I'm a history major with a grand strategy minor. Excellent. Very good. Thank you. Livia? Thank you, sir. Um, my name is Livia Reichman. I'm a believe a freshman at West Point, and I'm a Russian major and a counterterrorism minor. And currently, I'm on my way to the Naval Academy to present chemistry research, which is why I'm in uh, a oh, we, we admire you for taking full advantage of uh, webinar and Zoom technology and, and doing it on the fly like this. That's very impressive. Let's uh, have each one of our judges, if you would introduce yourselves to the team as well. I can go. So my okay. name is Mike Somas, and um, I'm a CPA in San Diego. Um, I've judged these competitions uh, six or seven times. I haven't done it in the last few years, but I find it extraordinarily rewarding because of the work that the presenters put into it, and I learn a lot every time I do it. So I'm really excited about this and I'm looking forward to it. Thank you for having me. Bob, Bobby or Christine or Nuria? I'll go, I'll go. Hi. Hi. Uh, hi, Jacob and Olivia. Thank you again for joining. My name is Bobby Kipp. I am a retired partner from PricewaterhouseCoopers, um, an accountant by training, and also spent uh, 10 or 15 years starting and running PwC's Global Ethics Program. And I've been judging this competition for a number of years. I don't even know, probably 10. And um, as Mike said, always learn. And I'm always just so admiring the effort and thinking and energy that all the presenters put into it. So good luck today. And we're looking forward to the discussion. Wonderful. Nuria? Uh, hi, good. Um, evening from Spain to all of you. It's um, a honor to be again in this competition. This is the second time that I have the honor to be with you, and I'm really happy for that. I am a passionate of ethics in business, um, and I have been working for the last 25 years in finance and compliance for different international of, uh, or Spanish groups. So um, I hope to enjoy this presentation. I am sure that I will do. And um, please, uh, let me learn from the presentation. Thank you, Christine. Hello. Yes. Hi, I'm Christine Watsky Albert. Um, I'm a senior manager of ethics and compliance at Permeant, which is a manufacturing organization in the Midwest. This is my first time as an IBECC judge, but I have previously um, judged other intercollegiate ethics and compliance bowl for the Association of Practical and Professional Ethics. I'm a certified ethics and compliance professional with over 15 years experience uh, managing various integrity ethics and compliance programs, both regionally and globally. I'm very actively involved in the compliance community. Um, I serve on the advisory committee of the Chicago Regional Business Ethics Network. Additionally, I'm actively involved with the Society of Corporate Compliance and Ethics. I've spoken at several of their compliance and ethics institutes, and I'm looking forward to this event today. Excellent, thank you. We have a, a wonderful panel of judges here today, and, and we're very fortunate to have them. 
And then we have one other person in the room. One might say that she's the most important because she keeps this whole thing going. And that is Sabrina. Sabrina, would you introduce yourself? Hi, can everyone hear me okay? <laughs> Yes. Um, my name is Sabrina, and I'm just going to be the tech facilitator for this session. Not just. She's going to be the person that holds it all together. So th thank you, Sabrina, for, for being here and, and making this all happen for us. I'd like to start by reading some instructions to you. There's nothing new about these, about these uh, instructions and because they've been on our website the entire time. And so you've probably read them. But what we do is we read them at the beginning of every presentation so that everybody Here's the exact same thing before their presentation begins. In this part of the competition, you are taking on a fictional business entity and assigning a fictional business identity to the judges. Please make sure everyone knows who you are and who they are before you begin. You will have 25 minutes with a five minute cushion to describe the legal, financial and ethical dimensions of the problem and to recommend a solution that passes muster on all three counts. During this time, you will not be interrupted by the judges. When you are finished, the judges will ask you questions for 20 minutes and during that Q&A, both you and the judges will stay in character. And, the, uh, and then after the Q&A, the judges will give you feedback outside of our characters. We will return to our regular role as humans and you will return to your regular role as students. And we'll give you some feedback on the presentation that may be helpful for you in the final two presentations that you give tomorrow. The ethical aspects of your analysis are the most important part. However, these should be described in a simple, practical, common sense fashion. Using technical philosophical terminology or basing your argument on religious or theological grounds will be considered a serious weakness. Also a weakness is simply reading directly from a script. During this presentation, every member of the team must have some sort of speaking role. And we will also ask you when you are speaking to look directly into your webcam so that you are making eye contact with us. In the Zoom world, people seem to have a tendency to look at their own screen and think they're looking at other people, but really, you're not, so you definitely want to look into your, uh, your webcam. Now, if I have it correctly, we are members of the Board of Directors of Nestle, and you are the same company, you are consultants who are consulting for Nestle. Is that correct? Yes, sir. We are sane in company. Any excellent. resemblance to real world stuff is accidental. Of course. Oh, excellent, excellent. Do you have any questions before, before we begin and let you take the floor? No, sir, thank you for uh, the overview and thank you all for being here to offer insight and giving up so much of your time to listen to our presentation. It's a real pleasure and honor. Excellent. Well, once again, welcome to IBEC and we are ready. You may begin now. Perfect. So thank you all again for coming today. Thank you to IBEC for organizing this. We think this is an extraordinary opportunity for Nestle. Um, and so to briefly review what we're going to be discussing is Nestle's involvement in Cameroon, in particular, their recent expansion and future expansion in the country and by extension, the region at large. And we will be taking a particular look at the ethical responsibilities and opportunities Nestle has by expanding in this region. So first off, to remind you all of Nestle's history of involvement in Cameroon, uh, Nestle has been importing Cameroonian chocolate since it was uh, importing Cameroonian cocoa since it was founded in the late 1800s, um, and has had a much more direct involvement in the region since the 1980s, uh, overseeing production and using the region as, its as an area to produce goods that would export and sell in many markets around the world. And it is currently expanding in Cameroon. It recently added 450 employees at a new plant in Dude. Um, and the region itself is a rapidly growing uh, part of the world and a real opportunity for Nestle's future growth. So now to think about Cameroon and its place in the world. So Cameroon it is a rapidly growing country. 
this is a particular concern to Nestle, given the fact that many of the countries and markets that operate in around the world are not so rapidly growing. So if you look uh, on our slide, there is a brief overview of its fertility rates by country in the world from 1970 to 2014. The key change to observe is that without immigration, a country uh, where fertility rate falls below two will of each generation be smaller than the prior generation, which in general means that market growth will be a lot more stagnant, if not now, um, because life expectancies can grow in immigration, likely within a decade or two. So Nestle operates disproportionately in Europe and North America as it stands. So the region that you're looking at um, that seems to stand out is Sub-Saharan Africa. So that's going to be the area where Nestle can be assured of massive levels of growth going in the future. This is tied with other broader trends such as urbanization. Um, Africa is expected to add about a billion residents to urban cities uh, over the next 30 years. Uh, urbanization is a proxy both for access to resources. So if Nestle is going to want to export goods, frankly, any goods, they're going to have much more access to selling it to residents of urban areas that are better connected to global parts of trade. So Nestle in, for example, Cameroon has done a lot of production of iron enriched um, baby formula, which can then be easily exported around the world. But the areas that will most easily be exported to would be say Buenos Aires or Cape Town rather than more rural areas for either of those countries. And it also means that Cameroon is now coming on board and accessing many of the global supply chains elsewhere that Nestle's already tapped into. So the two um, largest cities in Cameroon now have a combined population of 4 million, which is about half that of New York City. Uh, and the final thing to just keep in mind is that the world is growing more globalized and nowhere is that more true than Africa. So in 2021, there was a signing of the African Continental Free Trade Agreement, which while it is staggered in its implementation is slowly bringing together 44 countries in Africa and creating the second largest single market. Uh, and that's also tied with Cameroon's existent participation in other regional trade organizations like ECOWAS or CIFA. And with that, I'm going to pass it off to Olivia to review some greater depth on the business opportunities in Cameroon. Thank you, Jacob. Right, so one of the most important things to keep in mind is that Cameroon is currently profitable for an Nestle already imports about 2,000 tons of cocoa from Cameroon, and this shows that the market is currently profitable for the, for the company, it's currently able to be extracted, it's currently able to be taken advantage of. Not only that, but there's room for growth. So Nestle has already established ties with the Cameroon market, the Cameroon um, capital for cocoa beans and and the production of cocoa beans in Cameroon is growing annually from about 180,000 to 230,000 tons per year. These are metrics that are anticipated to increase by, by 2030, which is something that is very important to Nestle's long-term business plan. In order for Nestle to do business in Africa, the most important thing is for it to have a stable and long-term business plan, which Cameroon offers a good opportunity to establish within the country, establish within the economy, establish for Nestle as a growing business. Already, Nestle is working with about 109,000 farmers mostly in West Africa, and they're newly focused on working directly with small farmers and shifting away from plantation-style development. So, Nestle has already established ties to the Cameroon market, and Cameroon is an underexploited and growing market, which means that there's a lot of room for Nestle to be able to expand its own capital while improving the Cameroonian economy and livelihood for the Cameroonian people. So it's a win-win situation. Four million people now live in the major cities in Cameroon and all of these people are potential employees. Nestle provides about 50,000 jobs within Africa today and that number is only increasing. In 2000, there were 8 million middle-class consumers and now there are 16 million. So statistics like this point to the fact that Cameroonian markets and the Cameroonian economy and the Cameroonian population is increasingly growing and what's more
most important to keep in mind is that while we see immigrants of Africa facing many problems, facing poverty, facing malaria, drought, famine, Nestle has the opportunity to improve the living conditions of those people who are desperately in need and want to have their lives improved by uh, local corporations who can provide jobs for them, who can provide uh, any growth for them, who can provide opportunities for them to improve their own situation. Nestle's revenue has declined 5% since 2012 and is in the need for a growing market. So in this way, by encouraging growth and encouraging production and involvement in communities, Nestle can benefit themselves as well as benefiting the citizens of Cameroon. So to tie this together, there's a lot of opportunity investment available in Cameroon. Nestle has already been manufacturing goods in Cameroon since 1981, and Cameroon is a very, is a very um, strategically beneficial region for Nestle to do business in. It's in the middle of the Tripoli, Windhoek, and Lava Sambosa Highway which are two unfinished trans-African highways under construction. Cameroon is the largest and most diversified economy in the six countries the map trade group, which means that it has ties to global organizations. It's growing ties to the African Trade Organization, and uh, this points to its potential for increased growth over the next few years. And Nestle has been expanding its manufacturing footprint and hiring since 2018, and it's very advantageous for Nestle to do business in Cameroon. So Cameroon is currently profitable. Nestle is currently working in Cameroon. And on the other hand, there is room for growth both in Cameroon and both for Nestle. Slide, please. So as we move into more of a technologically advanced age, social media has put ethics yeah, more on the forefront of both consumers' minds and employees' minds. So the ethics of an employee's company have become increasingly more important for these employees. Nestle has alleged, Nestle's allegedly aggressive marketing of baby formula in 2011 gained extremely negative traction and international condemnation that uh, could have increased of significant harm of its bottom line, and these sentiments were propagated through social media platforms like TikTok, Instagram, which reached millions of viewers a day and have a unique and instantaneous power to be shared. Information on these platforms has a unique and instantaneous power to be shared. And this is becoming more and more relevant to companies. I would say it's one of the most relevant factors to a company's success. Because popularity, which is the main selling point of all of these social media apps and social media platforms, is make it or break it for companies, for celebrities, especially with cancel culture these days. Um, and scandals can transform really successful brands into brands that no one wants to associate with on a large scale, millions of people over over one image. So. Social media makes ethical scandals more likely to impact the corporate bottom line and more relevant for its employees. So it is in Nestle's best interest to work with moral, ethical, legal standards and uphold the of those standards, not only for the benefit of Cameroonians and Cam Cameroonians and Cameroon the Cameroonian economy, but also for the sake of its own employees and for its own consumers. Feel more comfortable buying for buying from and working for a company that upholds these strict standards. Thank you, Olivia. So to move on to discussing um, beyond just the business framing of why this would be advantageous, um, Nestle's and to 
why it would be advantageous for Nestle to expand and continue expanding its involvement in Cameroon, it's important to start acknowledging some of the very real ethical and legal issues that are present. So to frame that, it's worth acknowledging both that Cameroon has a broader history of exploitation beyond any uh, modern corporate involvement. It was colonized by the French, it was colonized by the Germans, and it was colonized by the British. Uh, and it was used primarily for resource extraction. So when we talk about where Nestle was getting cocoa beans in the late 1800s, they were grown generally by government-backed plantations in uh, Cameroon and by workers who enjoyed very few rights and high levels of exploitation. There's also a more recent and equally broad history of corporate exploitation of countries throughout the developing world, particularly along the lines of resources. So as we've noted, most of Nestle's involvement in Cameroon thus far has been using it as a source of resources, in particular cocoa, um, rather than using it as it's starting to shift, using it as a market, as well as a source of labor for manufacturing and more advanced processes. So looking at that history, Nestle also has some involvement in modern times with scandals relating to corporate malpractice. So there's a particular risk when we're looking at corporate malpractice of you get organizations like the role Firestone played in Liberia is a, prom is a prominent one, but there's ample examples of corporations playing a dominant role in a small underdeveloped economy where they're incentivized to get monopoly level control over a natural resource. And in order to increase and maximize profit, they need to drive prices down further, generally drawing them directly out of the budgets uh, allotted to paying salaries or helping with workers' rights or stuff like that of local employees. So that tends to disadvantage farmers. So when you look at, say, Cameroon's history in the 1980s, you actually saw, despite massive levels of global economic growth, Cameroon's GDP per capita in real terms fell by about a third. And that was in part due to falling commodity prices and the more exploitative relationship that corporations had. So if Nestle is wanting to guard against serious moral hazards, uh, as their mission statement has, and as a focus they've taken on renewed emphasis on human rights development um, and lots of voluntary goals they've taken on regarding how they partner with local um, businesses and how they try to pursue stuff like environmental goals. Nestle is going to want to shift away from a darker history of corporate exploitation that's particularly true in West Africa. And just on a final note, Nestle's had a number of um, pretty meaningful scandals in the 21st century that are not necessarily related to monopolistic levels of control over resources in a certain developing country, but rather issues surrounding labeling, advertising, uh, food quality, issues like that, which often come down uh, to how they work with local partners. So either being accused of having unfair advertising practices or having partners use unfair advertising practices or subpar production standards. It's caused Nestle no small share of headaches. Uh, recently in 2011, there was Oxfam and a number of other organizations that signed a letter that have uh, driven Nestle to willingly adopt uh, promises to uphold higher than usual standards when it comes to how they work with their employees in the environments they're operating in, particularly in the developing world. Now, some of the legal and ethical issues that are going to be endemic and operating in a country like Cameroon in particular, but are going to be more broadly applicable to lots of markets that are underdeveloped and offer Nestle opportunities to respond uh, and seek growth, but are going to carry unique risks. So there's obviously concerns about government corruption, uh, whether it's uh, high tolerance of bribes or even just simply confusing and underdeveloped laws that leave openings where perhaps one ministry views the tariff rate as being something than a, a, at a different rate than a different ministry uh, that can lead to confusion. There's also concerns about child labor. That can be either concerns about like Nestle operated factories or third parties they collaborate with. Um, for example, the farms that Coco is purchased from, uh, the companies responsible for shipping and transporting goods, as well as in particular to Cameroon, there's a greater than number of concerns around terror, um, insurgencies and corrupt armed forces. There's right now the Amazonian crisis where English speaking minorities in the west of the country, the part that was uh, colonized by England, are pursuing independence. That has led to some terror attacks and bombings in the capital itself, as well as the largest city of Yonde. It has also led um, to difficulty in transportation 
in the west of the country. There's also Boko Haram in the north. And the government forces combating them aren't always upholding the strictest ethical legal norms. How that can impact Nestle, in addition to potentially endangering employees, is there's often going to be checkpoints set up when shipping goods or importing goods throughout the country. So whether that's getting cocoa from outlying farms or whether it's selling products that they've begun to market in Cameroon, there's the risk that whatever transportation they're using could inadvertently fund militias, terrorists, or corrupt parts of the armed forces themselves if there's, say, a group of armed militiamen demanding prices at tolls or other key points on roads and transportation areas. And finally, it's worth contextualizing the moral hazards that Nestle is dealing with here, in that Nestle is not the only actor here, and it's certainly not the only actor that runs the risk of aiding and abetting damaging things. So there's lots of corporations that can have predatory or monopolistic roles in countries they're operating in. In Cameroon in particular, there's been the role of a lot of French financial institutions. Cameroon doesn't really have monetary sovereignty. And there are very few large Cameroonian banks. Almost in, the country is almost entirely reliant on French financial institutions that often adapt policies that are better suited for French commercial interests than necessarily, say, having a lower value of a currency to ease the export of goods um, as the government of Cameroon is trying to pursue using non-monetary policy. Cameroon's also been a big source of Chinese investment. There's been lots of discussion of Chinese debt prop diplomacy and the idea that Chinese and Chinese state-backed firms can offer large um, loans that are often pushed through using corruption and bribes to perform projects that aren't necessarily wanted or in super high demand in countries and leave the local government holding on to large amounts of debt and almost exclusively using Chinese firms for the actual construction to minimize the economic benefit to the surrounding area. And there's particular concerns around the government itself and the role it can take. Currently, the Cameroonian government, in a way that is favorable to foreign direct investment is easing regulations and adding explicit incentives to attract foreign investment. But many other countries, including in West Africa, have taken steps to uh, nationalize domestic industries, often in horrific ways. So Equatorial Guinea during the 1970s was known as the Dachau of Africa because the government nationalized um, most of its key industries, such as lumber and rubber, and used pretty horrific means of forced labor to collect the resources. Now, when we're talking about legal resolutions to lots of these endemic issues, it's important to acknowledge that there's a distinction between public law risks and private law risks. So if you look at the graph, you'll see um, Cameroon's ranking on the index of least corrupt countries to do business in, and it is rather high up. It's, it's generally in between the 140s and 150s. So there is meaningful levers, uh, meaningful amounts of corruption that need to be dealt with there. So when we look at the legal risks and liabilities Nestle takes on, there's going to be public law risks, which can be violating either Cameroonian law. Um, once again, Cameroon can at times have conflicting laws uh, on some of these things, depending on which government agency you're looking at. Uh, but that can be environmental damages, child labor, um, trade law. Uh, Nestle recently got into some trouble for using cocoa sourced in Cote d'Ivoire uh, cocoa that was being grown illegally on national preserve land. Um, so there's a similar risk to any operations in Cameroon. Then there's going to be much more private risks that are going to be taken on when you're talking about contracts and transactions. Many countries, including the United States and the United Kingdom, will penalize multinational corporations for failure to do enough sufficient due diligence when it comes to cooperating with local uh, companies. So for example, if the construction company that Nestle contracts to build its new factory in Yunde is using child labor, that can get Nestle potentially into legal trouble in countries outside Cameroon, even if the, com even if the company they're contracting with doesn't necessarily violate Cameroonian law. Uh, then it's also important to acknowledge that there are anti-corruption controls. So it's illegal for companies that do business in America to pay direct bribes to government officials, um, which once again, Nestle could potentially run afoul of. And so then it comes to the question of how does Nestle mitigate this risk? Some of it ultimately is impossible to resolve completely. It's difficult to do business in, in countries that have ongoing civil wars, that have lots of poverty, 
have often explicitly uh, conflicting laws. Um, there's just challenges to that. And it's in all likelihood, Nestle could do the best job imaginable trying to resolve these conflicts and still find itself every few years having relatively minor scandals, which involve paying um, American, Cameroonian, what have you government, some amount of legal penalties. Uh, this is probably just going to translate to a slightly higher cost of doing business that's gonna probably be more than made up for by lower uh, wages uh, that can be paid in countries like Cameroon, which has a GDP per capita of about $2,000. It's also worth pointing out, however, that situation in Cameroon is changing for the better. In addition to generally trending lower in recent years, especially post 2018 on corruption indexes, there was a 2020 law which passed um, that's created a national development strategy to encourage and simplify the laws governing foreign direct investment. Um, there was the creation of the Cameroonian Investment Protection Agency in 2013, which is an organization dedicated to assisting foreign corporations in investing in Cameroon, and there's internal corporate practices. So probably the biggest one necessary for combating risks of corruption is identifying politically exposed persons and keeping a roster of them and being cautious. It's, almost, it's going to be almost impossible to avoid dealing with any politically exposed people, such as say the child, uh, the son of the trade minister or something like that but it can be mitigated. And the other thing is to consider having an expanded role of uh, corporate HQ, having direct oversight of resolving these legal issues, as well as considering how corporate compensation is set up. Historically, lots of, countries, uh, lots of companies operating in places like Cameroon have run afoul when corporate incentives encourage managers to say, just extract as many resources as possible or produce as much and, and turns more of a blind eye to how that's being done. Uh, that's how you get plantations operating in national preserve land or pretty egregious worker rights violations. With that, I believe five, Jackie five is Five minutes on. left, Jacob, five minutes. Uh, has Jackie managed to join? Yes, I'm here, Jacob. Okay, perfect. So then I'm going to pass off to Jackie for talking about some of the ethical resolutions. Thank you, Jacob. Um, so when we consider the ethical concerns as Jacob has uh, briefly touched on already, we can consider um, what good Nestle is doing in addition to what it could improve on. So we look at what they're currently doing in terms of um, how ethically right or wrong it is. And we see some, some positives that they have done with their campaigns. Um, one has been combating iron deficiency. Um, anemia has a very strong prevalence in Africa with about 60% of children under five and 40% of women between 15 and 49 being affected with long-term impacts, especially on pregnant women. Um, Nestle, recognizing this, launched the Live Strong with Iron campaign in 2021 and released products called Magi Seasoning, Needle Milk, and Serilac Infant Cereal that were enriched with, I think, five times more absorbable iron um, compared to previous products and without compromising food quality. So it was very well received by Cameroonians, uh, especially at a very cheap price that they could afford and um, really continue to add to their, um, their diet. Um, another uh, positive that Nestle has um, demonstrated its uh, business to, to contribute is, this, is to the socioeconomic development of Cameroon. Um, while it may seem like a small number, it's a really good first step in that 450 are employed um, working in the Nestle Cameroonian factories, and it has become a source of income for thousands. The trade minister himself has said that it's a very much appreciated effort that also takes into account the national public health considerations. Um, 37.1 million was invested into um, Cameroonian so far, and um, with Nestle's involvement there, we think it can continue to grow. Um, an additional uh, ethical obligation we believe Nestle has is, in a, is a responsibility to its shareholders. So we do think that um, Nestle being a business does have the right to do business in a place where it can make profit. Um, and one more good thing that Nestle is currently doing is setting a precedent for doing global economy. Um, a lot of companies are nervous to do business in underdeveloped countries because of what, what it may mean for their business. But we do see Nestle being a for, Fortune 500 company and taking that step that maybe we should not be afraid to, to do business where success isn't guaranteed or it's a little bit um, nerve wracking. So we think that that's a really good um, a good president Nestle is, is setting for um, wealthy corporations. 
Next slide, please. Okay. So some future actions that we think Nestle can do, um, because we do think that they can continue to improve upon their contributions, is um, just keep checking their view of Cameroon. We keep reframing it, that it's not just a resource and it's not just a place of laborers and consumers, but that these that their workers are people and are um, entitled to human rights as much as any other person would be. Um, we believe we can instill jobs within the Nestle Corporation to ensure that this will um, that this view will stay in mind, such as an ombudsman, which is somebody who um, will investigate malpractice within the administration, in addition to ethics consultants and um, social workers to uh, talk to Cameroonians and make sure that they are being treated and um, just respected in, in everything that they're doing. Um, an additional principle that we think could be employed as a participation principle, which um, when it comes to these morally hazardous or dangerous uh, questions that arise when doing business in an under, under oh my gosh, in an underdeveloped country such as Cameroon, um, we think that gaining, um, gaining insight from the people living there can have a really positive effect in making sure that their, their voices are heard. Um, with them kind of participating in what what farmers um, we should outsource to it or what trade routes we should um, import from, we think that that can make sure that all voices are heard and uh, the best possible ethical action can be taken. Um, in addition, with this principle would be the vulner vulnerability veto. Um, one which, minute, one minute, one minute. Thank you. Which states that um, in questionable situations, if people are going to be vulnerable to a risky decision, that that decision be um, made with the least amount of uh, risk possible and the least amount of harm possible. Um, just generally, we think that Nestle should continue to operate on good faith and recognize its broader ethical goals in terms of global commerce and um, treating people with respect. I'll pass it off to Jacob to round it out. Jacob, you have about 15 seconds to wrap it up, 15 seconds. To end it, we think that Nestle, if it wants to see growth, it's going to need to go where the growth is. And that means operating in countries like Cameroon. They carry real risks, both ethical, legal, and reputational, when it comes to the risks that happen in countries that are experiencing high levels of chaos, poverty, and relatively low functioning government compared to some of the more sophisticated Western and developed legal norms they operate with. But at the end of the day, that's also where Nestle has the opportunity to do the most good. Uh, worker training for someone operating a bodega is not going to do much, but Nestle has a chance to meaningfully change the trajectory of the lives of millions of people by helping enrich countries like Cameroon. Okay, thank you very, thank you very much. Sure we appreciate that. Thank you very much. I know under difficult circumstances, but uh, we sure appreciate your information. All of my uh, judges here today are, are, uh, have a lot of experience, so I'm just going to turn over the questioning from board members to uh, to them, who would like to start? I'm going to call on you. Uh, I'll I'll start. I'll start. Okay. Thank you. So, um, thank you, thank you very much for the presentation um, and um, understanding that Nestle is is a part of the Cameroonian economy. I think is is good for the board to know about. But um, we're buying 2,000 tons of cocoa from Cameroon. And Cameroon produces uh, between 130,000 and 180,000 tons of cocoa per year. So I don't think we're, we're a huge force or a huge presence in Cameroon. We employ 450 people in Cameroon on a population of 10 million. So while the 450 people, I'm sure, helps the, the local economy, um, certainly we're not uh, employing a very measurable percentage of the economy. So I guess the point is we as Nestle have a lot of international concerns. Your, um, your suggestion that we are aware of the, the moral hazards and that we approach them cautiously is appreciated. But given that we have a somewhat small footprint in Cameroon, um, how do you propose that we leverage that footprint? Thank you, sir, for the question. And we think that raises an excellent point. Now, there's two important pieces of context to keep in mind. One is that Nestle is the largest um, Fortune 100, is the only Fortune 100 country 
uh, company to be involved in Cameroon that isn't related to either oil extraction or finance. So when we're looking at like selling consumer goods, um, Nestle actually is, even though it's a very small footprint relative to its competition in Cameroon, it already has a huge leg up. Like Hershey's isn't really operating in the country at all. Uh, so the other thing is obviously that means there's a lot of room for growth. So as I think our presentation touched on, Nestle's historic involvement in Cameroon has been pretty simply uh, importing cocoa and they import much more of their cocoa from places like uh, Cote d'Ivoire. But it does mean they have a history of operating there. They have access to the kind of third party um, consultants, uh, transport exports, uh, uh, transportation companies and stuff like that, that you need to expand. And more importantly, Cameroon is a country where even though their footprint is small now, it's rapidly growing and it's where growth is gonna be happening. Again, a million people enter the Cameroonian middle class every two years. If you want to talk about an area where you have access to more workers, more employees, um, and a bigger and growing market, Cameroon is exactly the kind of untapped, largely untapped market where Nestle has some experience and familiarity, um, but hasn't tapped into most of the potential that is there yet. Thank you. Bobby, thank you. So I, I just want to clarify a couple of things. And thank you for the presentation. It's really important to us as board members to get this kind of advice. Um, so historically, we've we've basically just imported cocoa from Cameroon. Are you suggesting that we are uh, expand to create factories that produce finished products that then get exported uh, around the world and uh, that we use local talent entirely to do that? Um, I want to understand exactly what you're proposing and if you if you can help us lay out what the financial requirements are for that. I mean, is there even space to build these facilities? What are the challenges with that? That kind of thing. Perfect. Thank you again, ma'am, for the question. Um, and so what we're highlighting is how Cameroon, which historically has been used primarily just for resource extraction and on a relatively small level, is providing an opportunity in particular to sell goods and to produce them. So Nestle recently in 2018 promised to expand its uh, factory in Ude, which currently only employs a few hundred people, but with tens of millions of dollars of investment can expand pretty rapidly. Currently what they do is they produce um, baby formula and some other like dried milk products, which are exported around the world in particular to Africa. And the key thing that we're identifying as a particular moment of change is with the creation of the African Continental Free Trade Agreement with construction on trans-African highways is Cameroon is going to increasingly be a good launching off point for exporting other goods to the growing market within Africa, as well as markets around the world. So increasing that manufacturing footprint. Cameroon is a place where you have opportunities to get more workers, um, to get more people who are living in urban areas and looking for upwardly mobile jobs like Nestle can provide. And at the same time, it's an area with more consumers, in particular for a new line of products Cameroon's been, uh, uh, Nestle's been focusing on, which is iron enriched um, food goods. But it would be on, like it, to put numbers out there, their current investment is $35 million expansion. There's clearly room for much more. Um, but if you were to say, I think it's planning to finish in like 2022, to then move on to a $70 million expansion that's going to perhaps shift to some of the production of like millet based products or other things like that that Nestle has, that's going to be poised to take advantage of a rapidly growing African economy and a rapidly growing Cameroon. Christine? Christine, did you have any questions? Sorry, I was looking for my unmute button, so I apologize about that. <laughs> um, thank you very much for your presentation. It was very interesting and engaging. Um, I do have a few risk mitigation questions um, since you did touch upon it, um, especially, you know, you had expressed a challenge in doing business in countries with, with some of these civil issues. Um, so a question that I had, um, especially as it related to the identification of politically exposed persons, and you had mentioned about keeping a roster of those persons, is Nestle going to have to depend on engaging with the politically exposed persons in order to conduct business in that region? Yeah, 
And unfortunately, um, it, it would be exceedingly difficult to do business without dealing with any politically exposed people. Um, for some reasons that are totally, uh, Cameroon has a far smaller number of, for example, people with postgraduate degrees uh, than most other countries. So lots of the experts you're looking at who are dealing with or, or ranking highly in government organizations or have had uh, higher levels of education are often going to be drawn from a relatively small political elite. So part of it is just the reality of how it is. There also is relatively high levels of corruption and, and some nepotism with the emplacing of people. So when you're dealing with almost any government industry or any large uh, companies, like the largest trucking company, I think was is family run, but perhaps more family run than like say the Mars company would be, um, it, it would be very difficult to not deal with any politically exposed people in doing business. But part of the reason to have that list is so you can have people from higher up signing off on it. So you're not leaving like a country manager handling the responsibility for accidentally being involved in some kind of corrupt scheme. Okay. Thank you. And then another question I have, uh, thank you for that. Another question I have is um, the engagement of an um, ombudsman. Would that be like on site? Like what are the longer term expectations of that outside of just a reporting perspective or an investigation perspective? What's kind of your, your thought process with that? Yeah. Um, so we realized with our uh, limited involvement in, in, or with Nestle's limited involvement in Cameroon, having, having a sole um, person being an ombudsman there would probably not be, um, not be super, super like useful with, with such a small presence. But we do think if we continue to expand, we definitely can have um, people whose job is to make sure patrol um, and see like in, in real life what's going on and making sure that um, everything is running as it should be and, and um, to ethical standard. So we think that currently having an ombudsman probably something that's just within the administration back um, kind of on the home front, but with the expansion and continual um, growth of jobs and um, further investment in Cameroon, we think that this can be um, definitely implemented and um, branched out in several different ways. We could have people that are um, focused on administration issues and then people who are working with um, the employed Cameroonians and just kind of like branch out as we continue to branch out to reflect the growth of our uh, of Nestle. Thank you. And one further point to that is it just does also relate back to how corporate oversight is structured. Um, the idea that other scandals Nestle has been involved with have often when financial incentives are aligned uh, to have just whoever's running the uh, Nestle's operations in the, comp in the country uh, expand as aggressively as possible along kind of one metric, which is perhaps resource exploitation and not how is land being used. And so having an independent ombudsman who's outside the direct influence or control or pay or financial control of Nestle's chief of operations in the country, even if it's still one person, hopefully it would expand to be more as the, as the company expands, would be a powerful way to avoid ethical reputational risks that come with the nature of the business. Nuria. Okay, thank you very much for the presentation, Jacob, Olivia, and Jackie. Uh, it was quite interesting, all the matters that you mentioned. Um, as probably you know, I joined the board of directors just some months ago, so I don't have enough knowledge of the company and I'm really concerned about all the issues you mentioned related to the business in Cameroon. So I would like to know uh, your opinion on how we can manage these unethical issues. And I mean, do you think that taking into account how we respond to the scandals in the past, we will be able to manage all these unethical issues? Are we prepared for that? Do you think that we have the procedures or the politicals uh, enough to, to, to face this risk or, or do, do we have to do something or what do you think about it? 
Yeah, um, thank you for that question. That's definitely um, really the heart of, of this, this issue here and determining where to go forward, right, with um, Nestle's involvement in Cameroon is reflecting on what Nestle has done in the past and determining how that's going to be prevented or addressed in the future when similar issues arise. So um, we think that we do need to definitely reflect on, on the issues that have risen in the past. Um, with previous scandals. And we think that that's exactly the kind of thing that we can use as fuel to um, expand Nestle in Cameroon and touch on those specific issues um, and provide specific solutions that maybe we did not have the knowledge of back then, but we do now. So it, it's going to be a very reflective process and it's not going to be perfect as, at first but it's really just going to be based on like this good faith effort and this like very like reflective look at our at Nestle as a company. And um, again, just reframing our, our um, reframing the view that we have in the locations that we do business and not looking at them as a resource, but looking at them as a, a group of people or as an economy with, with lives depending upon it. Um, does that answer your question, ma'am? Uh, yeah, thank you. I have uh, one question, and this follows up on Nuria's uh, question. As, as you have said, we have had image issues going back many, many, many years. In 1979, for instance, we had major issues with our involvement in South Africa and with apartheid. And colleges were doing things like in, in um, college dorms, cafeterias, they were offering two different, two different fruit cups over here, for instance. One would be from Nestle, one would be from another company, just so students could vote. And Nestle did not do well in, in that particular way. My question to you is, Amid all these stuff, things that we might take on that you have recommended, how are we going to restore trust? There is so much trust that we have lost. We have to admit and own up to that. Will people believe us? And why should they believe us? And what recommendations do you have for getting people to believe us that they were really serious this time? So I think the most important thing is not to leave. So the most recent big scandal Nestle had was in 2011 with issues of advertising formula um, and encouraging people to consume formula over breast milk, um, especially in areas where water wasn't often safe, which had some pretty negative impact and was a long running scandal. Um, so in some ways, Nestle's attempt to make amends is their new campaign to provide iron enriched foods in Cameroon. So how I, I think Nestle makes amends and, leave, and restores trust is when you have scandals in the past end up as footnotes and precedents to far more successful campaigns. And it's hard for Nestle to make a big show of making impressive or meaningful ethical changes in places like where it's mostly selling in, in wealthier parts of America and Europe, where there isn't super pressing need. But anemia is a terrible disease that like permanently damages 60% of children in Cameroon. That's horrifying morally. And the idea that Nestle could play a role in remedying that um, is a pretty extraordinary privilege in, in a lot of ways. And that's how you make amends and kind of put scandals of the past behind you is by being part of Cameroon's newer, brighter future. Can I ask a follow-up to that? Um, which is, I think that um, as on the board of this company, and we obviously we tried to advise on how to deal with scandals, how to make sure the reputation of the company and the trust is maintained and, and restored when needed to be. And so doing iron, you know, our campaign around iron and rich foods, the economic development, um, that kind of thing that you've mentioned are things that we can choose and have chosen to do regardless. I guess my question is in terms of taking advantage of the market that you guys laid out so nicely at the beginning of your presentation, the market opportunity in, 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 Africa, um, and particularly given the changes in African trade uh, arrangements, what other alternatives to us taking factories or building new factories for more chocolate production 
were considered to still take advantage of that marketplace, still continue to do the, the good things we're doing like around iron rich foods, et cetera. Were there other alternatives you thought of that might not have the same risks? Sorry for the long question. <laughs> no, no, of course. So it's important to name one of the alternatives which is not engaging with the kind of African market. Nestle has had scandals and it could have opted to pull out. Once again, the vast majority of its sales are pretty concentrated in Europe and America in particular, and to a lesser degree, Latin America and Asia with almost nothing. Um, Jackie just let me know that her computer just died. So unfortunately, I, I, I think the final closing uh, response will, will need to be on me. But, um, but so th that was an option. The other thing that um, as Nestle has an expanded presence in Cameroon is you, that, that's gonna be more meaningful is you can start to get more management and administrative level staff. So beyond just kind of expanding the current products they have, and there's a lot of opportunities of say, there's even price differences between producing stuff in like South Africa versus Cameroon. So you could start to move some products um, that are being manufactured, especially non-perishable goods that are being manufactured there. You could start moving them to Cameroon and expanding and diversifying in different ways. But the biggest thing would be the idea that you start to actually being able to draw on the growing number of experts and people who are familiar with the field there. Um, and Cameroon, for example, is a country with a lot of like Fula speakers or Arabic speakers. So if you could get eventually moving up um, access to some of the more educated um, people with actual local knowledge about one of the most important emerging markets in the world, that could bring about huge benefits for Nestle's expansion into other parts of Africa. Okay, I'm, uh, we, we are right at 20 minutes of, of questions. Thank you, judges, and thank you, uh, uh, students, for your answers. What we're gonna do now is we are gonna back away from our roles. We're gonna return to just regular human beings, both the team and uh, my judging team here, and give you some feedback on the presentation itself, things that you might wanna keep in, in mind for tomorrow when you have two more presentations. Who would like to uh, lead off with some feedback? I see Bobby, you are unmuted, so why don't you start? I'm sure. First of all, uh, you put a very, uh, very nice presentation together. You didn't read from the slides. It's well done and kept our attention by doing that. Well organized and well orchestrated. Um, so thank you for that. I think that, um, it, it, and you laid out particularly what the topics were you were going to talk about, talked about the topics and passed on very nicely. And didn't read from the script, so I'd say uh, very good on that front. Um, you know, obviously you had to pivot, which is what you're in school to learn how to do, and you did a nice job pivoting with your team. We had a little bit of trouble. I had a little bit of trouble, I guess, um, hearing Olivia. I don't know if her audio can, if she's going to be joining tomorrow, she might want to double check her audio. Um, and I, I. Um, yeah, I think so. From a presentation standpoint, you guys were compelling, and you should you shared the Q and A, which is important to do. Um, I particularly pay attention to that as a as a woman that the guys just don't take over and say I'll answer all the questions. So uh, you got, you did a nice sharing of that. So well done, Christine. Yes, um, thank you, Bobby, for your input. Um, I have a lot of the same feedback as well. Um, probably the one thing that was really impressed me was the ability to answer all the questions um, and, and not feel very flustered about it. You know, so I was very, very impressed with that. So that's my feedback is just very impressed. Nice young group of individuals to, to work with. So I appreciate it. Thank you. Mike? Mike? Yeah, thank you. I, uh, I thought it was a terrific presentation. I, I think um, I learned a lot from it. Candidly, I knew very little about Cameroon, nor the commodities there and, and what was going on there. So your research is very much appreciated. I, I learned a lot from the presentation. On the, um, the slide that says resolutions, um, Nestle is misspelled. Uh, you might take another look at that slide. Um, I thought that the, that the, the positive um, attitude came across. Um, Jacob, you've obviously um, very enthusiastic about this topic and it comes across very strongly. Um, and I think that was a real plus. It, I think that as much as the content kept my interest was that you were so enthusiastic about it and were trying to share with us something that you knew about, 
And so for me, it was it was very easy to listen, and and that made it really go smoothly for me. And and as other people have mentioned, the sound quality was a little a little troubling, but sometimes that's hard to to avoid. Um, and finally, I would um, probably run through a practice so that you're nailing the deadline, so that you're finishing you know on time, even give it a couple extra minutes, um, because you know there there might be people that are not quite as um, as forgiving as as uh, Jim <laughs> might just cut you off. So um, other than that, I thought it was a great presentation. Thank you very much, Nuria. Uh -huh. Um, I fully agree with all the comments uh, made by, by my colleagues. Um, I am really impressed for your presentation, to, to be honest. I think that you, all of you have uh, a very good knowledge about the country, the region, how to explain all the risk, uh, how to mitigate. I suppose it is because you study at West Point, but it's so, it's so great to hear you. You know, I, I I pay my attention in the second one till the end of the presentation, and I wanted more, to be honest with you. So it, it was, uh, oh, you know, I thought, oh, no, my goodness, uh, we have to finish. So it was, it was great. Your speech was great, too. All of you spoke very clear with calm and taking into account that I'm, no, I'm not an English speaker uh, is, is good to understand you very well. You know, this is a very talent uh, and the three of you have. So congratulations for, for that too. And the last one is that you, you, you presented a list of ethical issues, uh, very, very detailed, I think, you know, I'm not sure if some ethics consultant can prepare this list as good as you did. You know, uh, so I just can tell you congratulations for the presentation. Um, take into account the advice from Mike about the time. I think it's very important because at the end of the presentation, we have to, to be on hurry, you know, so please take into account the time because I think that you will get a very good, very good result in this competition. Congratulations to all of you and thank you very much. For, for that, I, I will just uh, just just close by echoing with a lot a lot of the same things. I allowed a, a number of minutes of extra time, given the fact that you had to pivot in some very difficult circumstances. But tomorrow, I would say that you're not going to get quite as much leeway. Mike pointed out that I might be a little nicer than than some of the Uber judges. Maybe that's true. But uh, I really, you really want to, to make sure your timing does not go over 10 minutes. And that's gonna require you to cut some content. There, you, you had a lot of wonderful ethical stuff there, but in 10 minutes, if you just go really, really fast and people don't understand what you're saying, that's not as good as cutting out some things and finding out exactly what is gonna be the most important for a board of directors. And I think if you do that, you will increase the comprehension of what you're saying. You'll, you'll feel more confident, you will rush less, and I think that you will, you will do very, very well. I really like the level of analysis. Sometimes I have to look down at my, at my uh, uh, notes, remind myself that these are undergrads that are speaking. There, there's a lot of very great graduate level speaking. That's that all I taught was graduate school. So I can tell you that you rival some some of my own students in, in your ability to do what it is that you have done. And then finally, I would say that be very careful about the 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 the, uh, the person piece, and that is first person, third person. You are talking to a board of directors at Nestle. So you don't want to talk in the third person and refer to Nestle as they. It is you, your people, your market share, things like that. Keep, keep us in the loop as audience members and don't just, uh, just make it into like a book report where it's all in the third person. That's an easy one to fix. Hey, hey Jim, can I just add something to that? And there's, there's nothing wrong with shame. It's being shameless about um, 
paying homage, if you will, to the board, right? So you you have done amazing things to manage this reputation, to make investments in in nutrition issues and 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 use local you know, develop local management skills and all that. And this is a, con a recommendation to continue and expand that because you have done that well. You know, it doesn't hurt to strike their ego, stroke their ego, so. Yep, that is true, Bobby. Thank you for that. Uh, Jacob, uh, I, I think you're the only one left. Do you have any questions for us? No, I, I just wanna say thank you so much for both the wealth of, um, you know, very valuable advice and insight. Um, I, I, I've taken careful notes of everything you said to share with the whole team. Unfortunately, you, you might have caught the drift, but there's been a cascading series of technical and logistical challenges. Um, but no, thank you very much um, for the insight, for your time, certainly for the grace with the, the, the few minutes of flexibility there um, and being forgiving with the, the timing. Um, but no questions. It's been very clear. Um, thank you so much. Great. Well, we really, really enjoyed your presentation and uh, thank you very much. Thank you for your service. Uh, currently and in the future to the United States. I have to, I have to put that in because I really believe that. You are doing wonderful things in so many areas and we really, really appreciate your, your coming to IBEC and your, your sharing your knowledge with us. Well, I'm going to close out the session right now, and the judges will, will go on their own and fill out their forms, and then we will reconvene tomorrow, uh, Jacob, and whoever is going to be presenting with you for your 10-minute and your 90-second presentations. Thank you good so luck. much. Thank you. Good luck, Thank Jacob, you. and good luck. Thank you. Bye. And thank Bye. you for your service as well. I appreciate Thank it. You. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all, and thank you for your time.